Hello, Sofa Squad, and welcome back to the damn sofa. That's the damn sofa, and as you see, that's my golly jeepering cute little sassy sidekick, Roscoe. Now today, we are going to be continuing our dreadful journey down ta the, 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 the Chad Daybell mindset, I guess you could say, um, of this horrifying book, One Foot in the Grave. This is installment three, but it doesn't, like, match the, um... The, the chapters we're going by. So today we're starting with chapter four. Now I'm gonna see how much I can get through it today. I might take a little break and come back into a secondary one. If I can't, we're just gonna see. Okay, we're gonna see how much trauma goes on mentally with me. Um, and then how much I can sit here and read of that. So anyways, um, if this is the first time you've been plugging into this, you might wanna start back at the first part. What we've been doing is going through it and reading through this book. Now, and again, if you haven't seen me go through this, this is not like a serious like, we're going to give this an academic treatment. I mean, you really can. I might use Chad Debo voice. I might break into character. I might add commentary. I'm trying to be good about being like, no, that's not what he said in there because it's definitely hard to tell. Um, so there's that. So what I'm trying to get at is this isn't 100% of a serious reading here of this, right? I mean, it is what it is. Uh, and that's it. Now, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. A lot of people are like, hey, I haven't been notified or whatever. Uh, just make sure you're subscribed to that. So go check real quick. Come back. Um, interact with the video if you want to stay on the Sofa Squad algorithm. I also have another channel reporting live from the Sofa podcast. Uh, make sure you're subscribed to that if you want to. I go live over there sometimes. And I do like little headline type stuff over there that kind of thing like way more um what do you call it like relaxed type videos and whatnot and this video is going to be pretty chill too i don't really edit these kind of videos because we're just reading through stuff um and i'm actually going to mute this over here because i forgot to turn that down on my computer okay so here we go let me get a sip of water Oh, and now you can't see it. Well, maybe you can. If you've been watching, y'all, I had to replace the Mickey Mouse ears. I couldn't, I couldn't unsee it. I couldn't unsee it. And it was like, I just, I can't. So I've replaced them. I'm sorry. Okay. So, chapter four. Bizarre but true. Okay, so, chapter four, bizarre but true. I sometimes come across cemetery-related stories in magazines or newspapers. And I often wouldn't believe them if they weren't documented. But these stories are all true. And throughout the rest of the book, I'll insert a few of these entertaining tidbits. I will start with one I'd wish I'd seen. The section header is called, Elephants Give a Little Lift. <laughs> Albert Shorty Sharp of Springfield, Missouri, spent most of his 82 years caring for and training circus elephants. Fittingly, big animals played key roles at his funeral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The outdoor funeral service began with huge Broadway bows slowly pounding on a drum with a mallet held in his trunk. 100%. I do not believe this already. Don't believe it. Do not believe it. Again, I might try and damn Google it when I'm done reading this. Don't believe it. Don't believe any damn thing you put in this book. Okay, so let's continue. Sorry, I just had to say that. Okay. Then he is okay. Sorry, I'm coming back in, y'all. He. What if we found out that he was like plagiarizing Dumbo, like he was plagiarizing children's stories of Bunny here? And you're reading this, and you're like, I don't a hundred percent know. It's been a hot minute since I read it, but I think he's talking about Pinocchio. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like, I, I, I call me crazy, but are we talking about Dumbo up in here? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. So, w l let me just start back off. So, the, the outdoor funeral uh, service began with huge Broadway bows slowly pounding on a drum with a mallet held in his trunk. Then Buddy, a smaller elephant, served as a lone pallbearer ball as he slowly pulled Sharp's casket on a cart to the gravesite. I mean, I just can't know with this. I'm sorry. Um, send me the article. Send me the article, y'all. I mean, for real. Sharp had died of a heart failure while traveling with the George Carden Circus in Wisconsin. His body was frozen, so his friends, both human and Pac Durham, could attend the funeral during a break in the circus schedule. On a tender note, one woman had fondly tucked a small stuffed elephant under Sharp's arm during his viewing, and the doll was buried with him. That was it. 
that was literally it. Y'all, at the end of this video, I hope I remember, and if I don't, I'll do a community post, because you know I forget things these days. Um, I want to come back to this and Google that and see. I don't want to stop now, because I don't want to, you know, break it up too much. Okay, so the next section, Larry, lay your head on my shoulder. We'll continue the animal theme for just a moment. One winter we buried a couple who had been killed in a head-on collision. In their obituary it was mentioned that their dear pet Larry, their dear pet dog Larry had also been killed in the accident. God, that's such a downer. Why do they have to, I mean, I just hate it when the animal goes too, you know what I'm saying? Okay, I didn't think much about it again until their headstone arrived a few months later. It listed the couple's name and Larry's. I soon saw the mortician who had taken care of their funeral. I took him aside and asked if Larry was actually in the ground too. He nodded, saying the couple's children had requested Larry be buried with their parents. Oh my god. Now, do I believe this? I mean, I could actually see this happening. Do I personally believe this maybe happened to him? No. But this seems more likely, right, of all the stories we've read so far. Like, I could see this, like, happening, right? Um... I must keep going. I soon saw the mortician. Oh, wait. Where I do that? Okay, it had cost the family extra money, of course, but the mortician had slipped Larry's remains into the father's casket right before leaving the mortuary. I figured this was highly unusual until I read a report that dealt with the subject. Often, a dog lover outlives his pet, and the owner has Lassie cremated. The pet's urn is then kept around the house until the owner dies, and then both are buried together. Families like to keep it quiet, but it apparently happens fairly often. For all I know, I may have a whole kennel buried in my cemetery. That is creepy. Okay, I understand the family's motives, though. Besides the bond the owner and pet had, it is less expensive than buying a plot in the pet cemetery. I mean, I cannot. Okay, so questions here. And again, I mean, I guess because I'm just kind of like, well, if you want to be buried with your pet, go for it. I mean, that's, I think, very touching, right? And again, this is filtered through Chad, so we can't really believe it, number one. But, like, number two, I mean, is there a reason why that would be like, oh, families don't want to talk about it? I mean, I don't understand why that would be a thing. You know what I'm saying? Like... I mean, is that like something to be embarrassed over, or is it like illegal to do that? Like, I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't understand why that would be a thing. Anyways, let's keep going. Get a hotel room or use a jail cell. Let's get back to humans. It's not just folklore that cemeteries add spice to the love lives of many couples. Oh my God, here we go. This is probably the damn root of him and Lori's whole thing right here. Okay, I guess people seeking make-out point assume the local graveyard will be empty. I can understand a teenage couple looking for a place of solitude, but one couple who would regularly visit the cemetery really sickened me. The woman's father had recently died, so she and her boyfriend would visit his grave often, but usually their mourning turned into other passionate emotions and they would make quite a spectacle of themselves right there on her father's grave. When I would see her car down there, I'd purposely drive the backhoe nearby to snap them out of their passion and remind them that they were out in the open for all to see. They eventually got married and I never saw them again in the cemetery. I guess the passion died, so to speak. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Do I believe it? No. Do I think Chad was probably jealous? Yeah. Do I think that he probably would have done something like this with Lori? Yeah. Just the whole thing. I mean, again, like when you start looking at, well, they eventually got married. I'm like, well, how do you know they got married? Maybe he knew everybody in the town. I try and first look at the filter of it's true. And then I go from there and I'm like, how like it usually quickly falls apart i don't know i i just i can't anyways another interesting case occurred during a major snowstorm it was about 8 a.m and so i was trying to get our snow plow cleaned off and ready i saw a woman pull an 18 wheeler into the cemetery that in and of itself was strange, but it was followed by a city police car. I figured he was going to give the woman a ticket and the two vehicles disappeared into the swirling snow I forgot about them momentarily, but as I got the snowplow warmed up, as I I forgot about them momentarily as I got the snowplow warmed up, but as I made my first plowing run through the cemetery, a few minutes later I saw the truck and police car parked at the bottom of the cemetery. 
I couldn't see either driver, but the vehicles were blocking my way, so I slowed down. Suddenly, the 18-wheeler's passenger door opened, and the cop sprinted back to his car carrying his boots. He had obviously been, give, been giving her away more than a ticket. I'm just trying to say that last part. It didn't say that last part. Okay, so it did say the thing about the boots. Okay, so the cop sprinted back to his car carrying his boots. He hopped in his car and sped off. The diesel then moved to life and also quickly left. I, will, I was admittedly curious about what I'd seen, so I stopped the snowplow and walked to where the vehicles had been parked. I saw the footprints in the snow where the cop had sprinted to his car. This clearly wasn't a, just a routine traffic stop. The cop was lucky I didn't recognize him, and although I don't think I would have reported him anyway, but what I've all often wondered what he had told hold on, but I've often wondered what he had told the police dispatcher he was doing while he was out of his squad car. I guess it should be applauded. He certainly was doing more than picking up a box of donuts on his morning break. And he really did say that. I'm surprised look at I me mean, okay, it's a couple of things. First of all, I'm surprised that he didn't call the mayor, right? Because, I mean, that's just what you do in this town. Anything goes wrong, you call Chad or the damn mayor. You call the sex or the mayor, right? That's the hierarchy. Secondly, again, it's just this power trip that he has. He's a damn graveyard digger, right? <laughs> I mean, he's ready to go to bat for, you know, he's going to turn in cops. He is taking names in that whole damn town. And, and I mean, again, this just look at how much sexual stuff has been laced throughout this book, right? First of all, starting off with the four, him saying a four-year-old told him he was the sexy one instead of the sexton. I mean, there's just some things when you sit here and put in it, and I'm just kind of like this. I'm like, and I guess it depends on the framework. Because at this point, I'm like, you've told us about a girl screwing her soon-to-be husband on her father's grave. That's completely creepy. Even if it was true, I mean, that's really creepy, right? We don't really need to know that. Like, that's like Texas Chainsaw Massacre stuff. A cop plowing a woman in the cemetery while you're snow plowing I mean that's creepy in of itself just sex in the cemetery is just kind of strange in this context the fact that he's making these choices to put it in here also the fact that he's probably making this stuff up also the fact that he's always very interested in being around the scenario right um anyways in fact let me just take a sip of water after all that that damn near wore me out The next thing, criminal mischief. Okay. It is surprising how many items are stolen from the cemetery besides someone's flowers. One morning we arrived to find all of the batteries stolen from the cemetery vehicles. The thieves had also cut the truck's gas lines and drained the fuel tanks. I hope it was worth their time. Thieves have also taken such things as our air compressors, tamping machines, and the U.S. flag right off the pole. But our strangest incident of criminal activity involved our riding lawnmowers. I arrived one Monday morning to find our mower operators extremely angry. They led me to our three riding mowers and every tire had been slashed. We just shook our heads knowing we had a long day ahead of us changing tires and getting replacements. Then I noticed a piece of paper jammed into a small opening in a nearby tree. I pulled it out and found a handwritten note that read, I can't believe you died before we could get married. I loved you so much and I want to die and be with you, but it would break my mom's heart. I will never have another boyfriend like you. So instead of stabbing myself, I stabbed a bunch of tires to show you my love. Don't forget me. Let me finish this real quick and then we'll talk. We called the police and they took the note to check for fingerprints. But they didn't find anything. I went through the records and tried to pinpoint who this person's boyfriend could be. But without success, I finally decided to just leave the incident in the past. I mean, y'all, I damn near want to call. I might just call a damn local cemetery and be like, could I please speak to the sexton? And I'm like, could you just please tell me, I'm going to name off a few scenarios, does any of this stuff remotely in the hemisphere ever happen to you? Who would in their right mind, why would you, I mean, why would you even write, so I slashed a bunch of tires. 
I mean, come on. And then the whole thing, so he just ripped up the cops for, you know, wanting donuts and all this little, you know, cheesy whatever. You, know, you, you, you got more than getting donuts. Now he's, for, but the cop, first person they're going to call though, right? You know, <laughs> when they need, when they need, you know, help for this criminal mischief. Um, but then, of course, he thought they couldn't find anything, so I started doing the investigation. Yeah, I'm looking around here, boys, seeing if I can't find another owner. You know, I didn't find another We let it slide. I figured, you know, little lady had been through enough. You know, it's okay. We'll get her next time. Okay. So the next thing is called, who would have noticed? People often fret too much about things that really don't matter, but this one takes the damn cake. We were burying a man known around town as an outdoorsman. He had always been a deer hunter, and he had requested to be buried in a flannel shirt and Levi's. Once the family was gone, we lowered his coffin into the vault, and we were nearly ready to be—we were nearly ready to put the lid on when the funeral hearse returned. This is the second time in this book this has happened, and this could potentially take place, but let's keep going. We noticed the mortician had an unfamiliar woman passenger in the hearse with him. The mortician hopped out and, she, and said, I am really sorry, but this woman is the man's cousin, and she is throwing a fit because she thinks one of the buttons on his shirt is undone. Can I check it out? She says the family won't pay us until she knows for sure. Okay, so seriously, I can honestly see people being this obnoxious and difficult. Um, do I... I mean, I don't know. I mean, do I believe it because it's from Chad? No. But do I believe this behavior out of people? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, sadly, but true. It had been a slow day, so I said, that's fine with me. Why not? We took the vault lid off and the mortician climbed down into the dark, scary hole and opened the casket. Yes, the button directly over the man's belly button was undone. The case had been solved. No, <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't say the part about the case had been solved and everything else. Okay. The mortician fastened it again, then shut the lid. He's also wearing long john, so he would have still stayed warm. He said with a tired smile, sorry to bother you guys. Woo, another crisis solved. Here's my thing. And I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe I'm being disrespectful, but if this was going on right here and somebody was like, we're not going to pay you until we know that a button is undone. I mean, who does that, number one, right? Why not just crawl down in there and pretend that you saw it and said, yeah. I mean, seriously, like why continue? I mean, seriously. Just move it along. You know what I'm saying? Move it along. I mean, this is ridiculous. I just don't even think that happened, right? I mean, that's my stance on it. I just don't even think that happened. Anyways, um, in the next section, shoeless. I always do my best to keep the morticians happy. If they're happy, I'm happy. But one request was a little unusual. Now, he says this about this as if half this damn book, if it was true, is not, is the norm, right? Um, like cl climbing down to the damn grave to undig somebody and make sure a damn button is done up is completely normal, right? Okay. Anyways, uh, I'm, okay, so where are we at? Okay. As the family gathered around the grave, the mortician pulled me aside and handed me a pair of Sunday shoes. He said, we forgot to put his shoes on. Whose shoes, I asked. The deceased, he said, you blubbering idiot. He didn't say that. When everyone is gone, could you just pop the lid and put on his feet? Put them on his feet? I reluctantly agreed, but when the moment of truth arrived, I failed. We opened the lid slightly and I felt around for his feet. But my hand went up his pant leg instead. The feel of his cold, fleshy calf nearly made me gag. I finally found one of his feet, but it was rigid. That was enough for me. I quickly placed the shoes near his feet and closed the lid. I queasily told my co-workers, he'll just have to put them on by himself. <laughs> now, here's the thing, and this is just side note, and I'm not trying to be like a snob or anything, because I don't have any books published. I don't have even a self-published book out there. But anyone who's done like basic creative writing one-on-one -on -one will tell you lines like, I queasily told all my co-workers are like basic 101 you never you absolutely do not do stuff like that you show them you don't say it i queasily is like cringe right but i mean that's here nor there at this point okay ashes or gravel 
Some people choose to be cremated before having their ashes buried in the plot, in the family plot. I don't mind since the size of the hole is much smaller. I can actually dig it by hand. One misconception is that a cremation is nothing but pure ashes, like the kinds you would find in a fireplace. Actually, the cremation process isn't that pure. I found this fact the hard way. The first several cremations I buried had arrived in nice solid boxes that weighed about 10 to 15 pounds. I would just put the box in the ground and fill the hole. The one fa then one family dropped off a lady's cremated remains and requested that her ashes be placed in the same box as her deceased husband. Uh, the family members claimed, pardon me, I had a little yawn sneak out. Uh, let's see here, where we go? The, hold on, hold on, here we are. The family members claimed there would be plenty of room. They then went on their way, saying they'd be back in two hours to have a de dedicatory service. Well, I dug around and found the original box, and there was no way the second box would fit inside it. I knew the family would be back soon, and I wanted to honor their wishes, so I popped open the second box and pulled out the cremated remains, which were contained in a sturdy plastic bag. I couldn't help examining the contents. There certainly were some ashes, but there were also shards of bone and a few teeth. I guess they don't burn well. I opened the first box and molded the wife's remains around the husband's plastic bag the best I could. Then I closed the lid. I couldn't help thinking that Resurrection Day is going to be complicated for those two. It could look like a game of Twister. <laughs> Let me get a sip of water here. I mean, this one's, this one, this is a long chapter, y'all. This is, again, it says 17 minutes left and my thing right now says 20 minutes. So we know 20 minutes is where I start to go like, oh my god, I'm gonna like punch myself in the face. Okay, here we go. A fitting farewell. As we all know, arrogant people are usually difficult to be deal with. Unfortunately, I mean, as if he's not one. Uh, unfortunately, the most arrogant ones can be annoying even in death. One local attorney had specified in his will that he desired to be buried in the largest coffin available. He wanted to go out in style. After the attorney's last breath, his family honored his wishes to the letter. My eyes nearly popped out of my head when I saw ten pallbearers struggling under the weight of his monstrous casket. You could have housed a small family inside that thing. To accommodate the monstrous casket, the mortician had specifically ordered the largest burial vault made in the United States. It was so huge that the family had to buy an adjoining lot because the vault was too wide to fit in a single burial place. I had only buried the other person in such a large vault, and that person had weighed nearly 500 pounds. <clears throat> Pardon me. This attorney had been average size, though, and we were only going through all of this trouble because he wanted the best. He was about to get it. We lowered the casket into the vault, and it fit by the narrowest of margins. But when we tried to put the lid on, it merely clanked around. The casket was six inches taller than the vault. The vault guy hastily called up the mortician, who had returned to the mortuary with the family. He tried to talk the man's children into switching their father's body into a smaller casket, but they wouldn't budge. Their father had one of the best and nothing else would do. When we heard that news, we felt pretty frustrated. It was getting dark and rain was falling. Then the vault guy smiled and said, well, we've got an old septic tank at the shop we had to drain and pull it out of the ground. He ought to fit in that. We readily agreed, so he called the mortician back and asked him to tell the family. We had the problem solved. We widened the hole a bit more, and the vault guy retrieved the used septic tank. He returned and lowered it into the hole. The stench wasn't too bad, and most important, that huge casket fit inside just fine. As we put the finishing touches on the grave, the mortician drove up to learn how we had solved the problem. And when he found out what we had done, he laughed so st hard he started crying. I love it, he said. The guy always treated everyone just like the stuff that once filled that tank. What a perfect send-off. The irony in that one is very obvious. I mean, and again, maybe they did this. I don't know. I don't know if y'all like remember some of the stuff, but we, like when things go wrong at like I don't know if it's cemeteries or 
the places where they do the bodies and stuff, but like where it's like, oh, well, we ran out of room there, so we just started stacking the bodies up, and now there's like a hundred back there. You know what I'm saying? Like where you hear these articles and you're like, oh my god, they're like in cars and everything. Urgh. So for them to be like, if this happened again because it's Chad, do I believe it? No. Uh, but for them to be like, here, dug up the old crapper out back into buried him in there. Yeah, did you find? I mean, I'm just like, place that's par for the course. All right, the next section. Just pay the shipping. The following story made me smile. <laughs> Only because I know so many people like this woman who make crazy decisions just to save a few dollars. I won't include her last name. I'm sure this lady has suffered enough. In November 2000, a woman named Janet put her dead mother in her car's passenger seat and drove more than a thousand miles from Colorado to an Oregon mortuary so that her mom could be buried next to her father. According to the Jefferson County, Colorado Sheriff's Office, Janet said she was trying to save money on the cost of shipping the body of a 91-year-old Mildred to Oregon. Transporting a body across state lines without a death certificate is illegal, because, but authorities chose not to press charges against her. Janet told authorities that about an hour after her mother died in a home near Denver, she dressed her mother's body in a fresh set of pajamas, carried her to the car, and then took her off to Oregon. After the mess was sorted out, a brief funeral service was held for Mildred. Mildred. She was then buried next to her husband in a Portland cemetery. Her daughter was not available for comment. Did the family, the next section, did the family ask for postal insurance? Several times I've received a cremation in the mail with instructions to bury the remains in the family plot. I doubt the postal worker had any idea what was in the package. However, there have been cases of a cremation ending up in the wrong address, ending up at the wrong address. One newspaper article told of a woman's cremation getting lost on its way from Michigan to Idaho. It was eventually found on a post office shelf in California. Of course, if you don't trust the postal service, you can take things into your own hands. We had one family haul their deceased grandma and her casket across several states in the back of their station wagon. Is anybody getting Little Miss Sunshine vibes from this? If you have not seen that movie, you gotta watch it. Okay. I thought those kind of, kinds of adventures only happened in movies. The family had the proper permits to transport her, but it was a weird sight to see young children sitting happily on the side of the casket. That's a trip those kids will never forget. Wait, hold on. Okay, what's that smell? I once received notice from a distant mortuary that they'd be bringing me a body for burial the next afternoon. The next day, I kept watching for a hearse to arrive, but instead a car pulling a U-Haul trailer arrived. Sure enough, inside the trailer was a coffin. That trailer still carried a strong, distinct odor long after we took the coffin out. I felt sorry for the next person who rented that trailer. The next section. That was it, by the way, for that one. That was, that was all there was to it. We only read the articles. Our cemetery is quite unique. It has the uh, it has quite a collection of adult magazines and videos. This because he was there does not surprise me. They, they before we even go farther, I'm guessing that he was like the what do you call it the librarian of them or something. He probably edited it up. Uh, and again, notice the theme. We're going to continually see themes of adult entertainment adult sex stuff going on in the cemetery with him there. It's very weird. It's very unsettling. Okay. Our cemetery is quite unique. It has quite a collection of adult magazines and videos. Of course, this collection is several feet underground. 100% he's dug it up. If it's even true. 100% he's dug it up. Ouch. <laughs> I'm sorry. Excuse me. God, it's got me snorting, y'all. Y'all know it's for real. <laughs> Get to <those> snorting. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, here we go. I got, whoo, I'm sorry, that one got me. It, it's just so funny when I do that. I'm sorry. It tickles me to death. Okay. A few years ago. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't help it. Look at my ear. Look at my ear. 
Okay, here we go. A few years ago, the local police raided a home and found a huge collection of, you know, porno. Uh, the police department didn't want those items to get back among the public. So, they... They hatched the novel idea of burying the collection in a cemetery. Sadly, I have a story about our local police department that is, I know for a fact, true. That makes me honestly think that this probably is true. Um, anyways. So, I might do a little story time on that sometime. Our crew dug a deep hole in a spot where a cemetery road would soon be placed. And the police arrived with their stash and locked boxes. These boxes were buried inside two burial vaults. The vaults are 10 feet deep and pavement now covers them. I can't think of a better place for such items other than a crematorium. I would pull a hundred percent. Trust me, it was kind of stuff that the police were like, this is bad enough to, first of all, I mean, y'all, even though, I mean, I can kind of see that in a way because I'm just like, I mean, they've done crazier stuff. But on the same note, I'm just like, oh, he totally dug that up, y'all. Totally. Again, with the theme of all this stuff going on, please. I'm just, and for him, oh, well, the theme of that, oh, please, honey, as if it's not all stashed under his damn bed at home or, you know, back then. Anyways, the next section Dim Bones, Dim Bones. Speaking of trashy material, <laughs> our cemetery garbage cans collect interesting things besides wilted flowers. Can you guess the number one item? Chicken bones from KFC. Apparently, eating Kentucky Fried Chicken during cemetery visits is very popular. I mean, it's good. Good God almighty. And you can't beat their mashed potatoes. Okay. McDonald's Happy Meal boxes are quite are also quite abundant. I can just picture a father announcing to his family, Hey kids, please quiet down while we go through the drive through window. If you behave yourself, we'll go eat at Grandpa's grave. <laughs> I personally don't see many people eating in the cemetery during the day, so it must be more of an evening snack kind of a thing. Yum yum. Of course, we occasionally find drug paraphernalia in the garbage cans, so apparently some people find other ways to relax during their visits to the funeral, to the cemetery. It just looks for every moment to make himself feel better against people. If somebody wants to mourn either damn KFC, let them mourn either damn KFC. I mean, my God. Anyways, peculiar picnic is the next section. One family took things a little too far, though. When it comes to the post-funeral luncheon, most families gather at a restaurant or a church for a safe food plan. Um, for a brief meal following a funeral. But this family decided to have a picnic right next to the grave before we'd even buried their grandpa. The woman spread out blankets and brought picnic baskets from their cars while the men hungrily, again with the, with the adverbs, uh, grabbed sandwiches and then lounged under a tree to watch us work. I didn't want to be the family's entertainment, so I asked the deceased widow if they wanted us to wait to bury her husband while they finished eating. Heavens no, she said. It'll be interesting to watch. The next ten minutes were excruciating for me as the vault guy and I did our best not to make a mistake. I mean, come. Fill the damn hole in. <laughs> Just fill it in and move on. I mean, my God almighty. For someone that wants all eyes on him the second he damn gets it, then he wants to be a drama queen. All the while we were being watched by 20 pairs of eyes. The only sounds to break the silence were people munching on damn KFC. No. <laughs> I'm just joking, it says. The only sounds to break the silence were people munching on potato chips and the occasional crunching of a pickle. Watching the burial of a loved one apparently didn't affect their appetites in the least. I mean, he says this, and then, you know, we know what we know now. But again, it's this kind of pettiness right here where I'm, I mean, okay, so this is just me, and I'm trying to think, but I mean, I'm also kind of like, I mean, to each their own or whatever, but I mean, and maybe I'm weird or whatever, but I'm like, I mean, it, I think it might be kind of interesting to watch someone finish doing the grave thing or whatever. I don't know. Um, do I believe that this happened? Probably not. Again, I get said it a hundred times. I just don't believe that any of this stuff happened. But the things that he chooses to get so high and mighty about, I'm just like, dude. You know, again, just, we tried our hard not to make a mistake. I mean, all eyes were on us. We almost had to call the mayor. Okay. The next section is called Down on the Farm. 
Large animals shouldn't be a major cemetery concern, but I cross paths with them more often than I'd like. For example, at one graveside service at, near at, at was hold on. For example, at one graveside service at was nearly dark. This is weird. And everyone was milling around, but the preacher refused to start the proceedings. Almost 15 minutes passed before a man riding a horse came through the cemetery gate. He actually was wearing a bandana, a hat, and an eye patch. As he approached, he yelled, I hurried as fast as I could. He tied the horse to a tree and joined the group. The mortician later said the guy had also been at the church. The preacher had agreed to wait for the guy to gallop from the church to the cemetery. The mortician heartily... There we go. Uh, we're going to take a shot every time he does it. Um, but I only have Coke and water over there, so... Uh, let's see. The mortician heartily agreed with me that maybe next time the cowboy could leave the horse in the barn and just catch a ride. Less than a month later, another animal made a memorable appearance. I was sitting in my truck waiting for a funeral service to end when a large cow came rambling through the cemetery toward the burial site. I jumped out and tried to herd the cow away, but it seemed determined to reach that graveside service. One of my employees, Tony, also spotted it, but neither of us could change his course. I'll see it in a second. But neither of us could change his course. The family of the deceased had also seen the cow, which was now within 15 yards of the casket. Some of the mourners were laughing, and a few of them even snapped photos of the occasion. Finally, Tony grabbed a long stick and prodded the cow away from the funeral and into another part of the cemetery. I called the city's animal control officer to come help us and he eventually lassoed the cow and led it back to the farm where it belonged. I'll never forget though how badly that cow wanted to take part in that funeral. Out of curiosity, I checked the background of the deceased lady to make sure there wasn't some strange cosmic connection between her and that cow. See, here we go. He's already starting. He was probably starting back with this like, well, I did her numbers and I found out that her and the cow had been married 25 times. You know what I'm saying? Um, okay. By all accounts, she had just been a typical housewife, although her obituary mentioned she was a vegetarian. I mean, give me a my God. Maybe the cow just wanted to stop by and tell her, y'all, hold yourself for this. Hold yourself for this. I'm going to read the sentence over again because we damn well might not look at the damn Golden Girls ever again. Might not damn read it to you. Okay, by, okay so well, let's just go over this again. This is how bad this is. This is iconically bad. By all accounts, she had just been a typical housewife, although her obituary mentioned she was a vegetarian. Maybe that cow just wanted to stop by and tell her, thank you for being a friend. I mean, oh my, I swear to God, he sets them up for these jokes. Like, I can see Melanie Gibb right there being like, yeah, that was really good. I, th I mean, when I got to that part, I was like, this is a bestseller. It's a bestseller. What do you think, Mom? I mean, seriously. This is what happens when you surround yourself with yes people. I just, I can't. Okay, so the next section is called, but also look at this part. Like, all of these things, he just turns his nose up at the situation. It's, like, so dismissive, so whatever. And I'm like this. Okay, so a lot of these things, I'm trying to imagine, like, a super, like, say, really conservative, traditional family that's, like, really... Like, and not maybe even traditional conservative is the right way to say, but like, how should I say it? And like a family that would be offended by, or like, um, uh, like, like the scenarios that he's describing, I'm like, well, maybe they would be horrified that a cow approached them. You see what I'm saying? Like, oh my God, a cow's ruining the wedding. This is, or the, the funeral. This is supposed to be perfect and this and this, and it's supposed to go all this way. You see what I'm saying? That kind of a thing. Like just very traditional, very, it's supposed to go this way. We can't have a cow interrupt it. Whereas I would be like, oh my God, that's so cute. A cow's here. You, you get where I'm going. Um, so that type of thing or whatever. Uh, but I don't, but then reading this, so the family I thought was cute. So I'm like, well, most of the family's not like they're cool with this, shit, with this stuff. You know what I'm saying? It's him that has this issue. Um, you know, so I'm just like, you know, it's, it's weird. Anyways, let's go back to this. Okay, so the next section is called, I would take a cow, wait. I would take a cow any day. 
We figured out how to handle a cow, but didn't do so well with large spiders. One summer, I began noticing beetle-sized spiders hanging in the cemetery's trees and bushes. And that right there, I would have been done. I would have quit. I would have burned the entire town down. I'm absolutely not. Anyways, uh, a nearby mountain is notorious for such creatures, and after a wild windstorm, we found dozens of them all over the cemetery. They must have been blown all... They must have been blown all the way across the valley. It took us several weeks to get rid of them, and they gave me the creeps. <clears throat> Pardon me. I would never stop near a tree, and suddenly one would... Oh, hold on. I would stop near a tree, and suddenly one would lower itself to eye level. Ugh. Uh, the whole crew was jittery until we got rid of them all. Another summer, we battled hordes of grasshoppers. You know what he's doing? It's like he's lining up. Like, I forget what you call it, but like... Like, remember, like, when the, the lotus and things like that or whatever? You know, the great the great summer of, like, grasshoppers and, you know what I mean? Anyways. Um, they would come out of a nearby field and literally cover the roads. People would come to funerals and freak out to see the ground crawling with bugs. It was like a horror movie with women shrieking and stumbling back to their cars. I was quite embarrassed. We tried everything to eliminate them, and we finally bought a product called Bug Be Gone. It worked miraculously, and you too can own some for nine ninety nine by sending a check or mail. No, I'm just joking. He wasn't doing a plug-in, but it would not surprise me. Uh, but they did get a thing called Bug Be Gone. It worked miraculously, and so we stocked up on several hundred dollars worth of the stuff for the next year. Naturally, we never had a massive bug problem again. If you need some Bug Be Gone, I know where you can get some really cheap. Now, he did say that. I predicted it. That's so weird. I shouldn't have corrected myself. Uh, he just didn't give the address and didn't give like a place to send a money order. The next thing is getting a leg up. I'm just like all comfortable. I'm lounged back in my chair reading this, you know. I'm <laughs> just like over here kicked back. Okay. My favorite headstone in our cemetery tells the story of its occupant who made his way to the grave in two parts. The first the first came in the late 1800s when, as a young man, he tried to stop a bank robbery. While pursuing the thieves, his left leg was shot off below the knee. Ouch. He survived, but his family didn't expect him to live long, so they just buried his leg in a box in the family plot, expecting that he'd soon follow the, le that he'd soon follow the leg into the ground. But the man pulled through. And he didn't die for another 40 years. When the cemetery crew dug his grave, they found the long-forgotten leg. The workers wrapped it up and slipped it off his coffin during his burial. So after four decades, all of his body parts were reunited. Speaking of detached limbs, we have in our cemetery database this burial record from the early 1920s. The lower half of Miss Robinson's leg. There is no indication that the rest of Miss Robinson ever made it to our cemetery, and she is certainly dead by now. I have often wondered, though, if she ever hobbled out to the cemetery to visit her missing appendage, what would she have at the graveside? A sock and shoe? <laughs> I mean, just the humor. It's just top-notch. Okay, the next section is called Rock On. One July day, I read in the newspaper that a terrible accident had claimed the lives of three sisters from our area. The women were all in their mid-twenties and were the fan club presidents of a modern rock band. In fact, they had been traveling between concerts when they accidentally drove off a cliff. I hadn't ever heard of the band before or since, but as the sisters' family came to select a gravesite, they were excited that the band had agreed to attend the funeral. I would tell you the band's name, but I honestly can't remember it. You know this isn't true. I mean, I'm, I'll, you know this isn't true. Already from right there, I tell you, but I don't remember. They drove off a cliff. It's all generic cliche stuff. He's probably describing a movie. He's probably it's he's it got Thelma damn Louise. If the two of the sisters are named Thelma and Louise, I'm done with the damn buck. I'm done with the damn buck. Okay. <laughs> There we go. Okay, so here we go. On the day of the funeral, the family arrived early for graveside service and waited expectantly. Yep, take a shot, expectantly, uh, <laughs> for the band to arrive. The girl's uncle told me these guys are going to be huge. They just finished their first video. Within minutes, a black stretch limo pulled into the cemetery and parked in front of my office. A huge security guard leaped out and scanned the area and then shouted at me, Stay back! Don't bother the band! Yeah, as if I'd been wanting to mob them. 
Then the three band members got out and they looked ridiculous. These stars were wearing some of the ugliest clothes I had ever seen at a funeral. And that's saying a lot. One, one man wore what looked like a dirty brown blanket. And the other guy wore what could only be described as a mini skirt and a halter top. When a woman who obviously fancied herself as the band's main attraction got out of the limo, her jet black hair was spiked and she was wearing white face paint, which didn't go well with her nearly transparent pink, pla pink plastic dress. She strutted around with her nose in the air, clearly miffed at the lack of fans there to worship her. In fact, all three seemed quite perturbed at having no one at having to attend the burial of their fan club president. Of their fan club president, at the graveside serv as the graveside service ended, those superstars basically sprinted back to their limo. I overheard the guy in the miniskirt say to the driver, "Step on it. Let's blow this joint." He actually wrote that line and said that, as if we're supposed to believe that. You have to admire entertainers who truly connect with their fans. Y'all, that, I mean, I cannot, and people probably lap this up like thirsty dogs in the middle of a damn heat wave in North Carolina summer. I mean, you know they ate this up. I mean, down to the cliches of the whole, the, what the band looked like. I mean, and what's so funny is he gets all pissy about that, but are these not the most narcissistic, sociopathic, psychopathic? serial killer pathic people that we've ever damn met. It's the hypocrisy for me. I mean, I just, I can't. Now y'all look, that this one right here is gonna be uh, damn near an hour long to get through one chapter. I had to break it up, I had to take a damn nap, to be honest. <laughs> I had to take a damn nap. I broke it into a nap and jumped it later. I'm not gonna lie y'all. The first part, when I started yawning, I had to go through and take one out and like edit it, this one a little bit, because I started yawning. I took a nap for 30 damn minutes. I was like, this book, this is putting me to sleep. And not that I don't enjoy reading it, but it's just, it's it gets to a point where I'm like, dude, chapters are our friend. I mean, this, this is, oh my God. But you know what I just looked? Four chapters. Okay, so we're going to start on chapter five next time. We're 43% of the book in. I mean, I think he forgets to do chapters along the way, and so he's like, oh, wait, I gotta do a chapter. And it's like, so, like, two chapters consist of the whole damn book, right? Um, makes me sick to my damn stomach. I, it just, the whole thing, I mean, just absurd. Absolutely absurd. I hope he never sees the damn light of day again. And to think that people just followed him around and just, I mean, ugh, so gross. So gross. Anyways, um, so there's that. So that's that's today's entry. I'm hoping to have this out for tomorrow. I'm recording this Wednesday, so tomorrow's Thursday. We'll see. Uh, so that's it. Thank you for joining, and thank you for sitting here and reading this absolute rubbish with me. Um, let me know what you think about the comments, and uh, that's it. Until next time, we'll see you back here at the damn sofa.